Hello and welcome back to the Clarity and Blue podcast sponsored by NordVPN. If you want the best discount code available off your two-year plan, there is a sumptuous discount code in the description down below. I'm your host for this one, Dan Rowlinson, joined by Matt Kendrick. Welcome back, Matthew. How are you? I'm all right, yeah. I'm glad glad to be back. I'm a little bit tired, Dan, but um, we'll, we'll play through because we're professionals, aren't we? We are. It's earlier than me and John normally record. We tend to do our Q and A's like midday on a Monday. It's eight AM. We're, we're up bright and early. We've got a busy day ahead, but we're here to talk about Aston Villa winning football matches, which is you know kind of what we do. Cracking result of the weekend, wasn't it? Standard procedure now, isn't it, for Villa to win football matches? It's always a concern, isn't it, after straight after an international break. But I suppose the the thing that we've got this year is oh, it's always a concern after a European game. It's always a concern after an international break. It's a good job that us lot make the excuses rather than Uno Emery and the team, isn't it? They just crack on and win games. But uh, you know, without being hot, too cliched, it can be a difficult place to go. Although it's a great away day for, for Villa fans, Fulham aren't, aren't a bad team, so. It didn't. Well, it pleasantly surprised me, but it didn't surprise me. If that makes sense. Yeah, we said on the post. Well, we said on the preview. First of all, you know, John, tough game, tough game, you know, tough place to go. You know, typical, typical Townley. And on the post match, you know, we recognised all the thing. Marco Silva's a good coach. Uh, Fulham should be higher up in the table than they are based off the, the start to the season they've had. They are a good side, and to be honest, aren't probably a million miles away from being a top ten side that could maybe push for the Conference League, depending on you know what the other clubs above them did. But it felt similar to the Fulham game of last year. We felt like we needed a result uh, at Fulham away last year and we got it. As this year, we've come off the Man United draw. There was the Ips- Ipswich draw not too long ago, uh, an international break. And if that game had petered out into a draw because they've scored early, we've got back into it, you'd have gone, eh, a draw at Fulham, you know, it's, it's, just, it's all right. Or they'll just find a way to kind of go through the motions, it feels like. And Oh, of course, Watkins will score a brilliant header. Of course, like Dean will, will put the, put a great ball in and that leads to an own goal. And we go, oh, yeah, three one, easy peasy kind of thing. Um, and we don't want to kind of take that for granted, but it's just what we've what we've seen so often over the last two years that like you say it is standard procedure. Yeah, it's what top clubs do, isn't it? They they yeah. win football matches. The fact that we've been able to establish ourselves as a top club so quickly um, is still still mind blowing. Really, um, just looking at the the top end the very top end the Premier League table now to see us nestled in there. I mean, I think most Villa fans would say that what do we think we've achieved? I mean, in certain games we've, we've been right up there, but I still think there's more to come. I think we're probably playing at 70%, 80%, 80% of our capacity. Um, suddenly got a real squad in terms of depth. It's exciting. I don't, you know me, I refuse to get carried away, so I don't want to jinx it, but the fact that we've thrust ourselves well and truly into the mix for the top four again, and we've got another ge- couple of gears to go up, it's just so exciting. <laughs> just wonder where this journey is going to take us, really. Yeah, and I think there are those questions in, in this show that are on that kind of theme, so we'll, we'll discuss that later. I'm just looking at the league table now. We've got what feels like a, a very small buffer uh, of the teams behind us of, of three or four points. So we're three points clear of Chelsea, uh, four clear of Spurs, five clear of Newcastle, two clear of Brighton, but you know, I don't. To, to be perfectly honest, I don't expect Brighton to be up and around the top six come the end of the season, so I, I am discounting them a little bit. But you know, they may prove me wrong. Level on points with Arsenal and Liverpool and Man City are a little bit ahead of us now, as you, as you probably kind of expect. You know, we keep saying Liverpool, and Man City are the two best sides. Arsenal are probably the third, and Villa are probably the fourth, and that's ha- how it is. But you look at the the Arsenal record. Our our record just on like the basics of one draw, loss, goal difference is identical besides goal difference where Arsenal's is two better uh, level on points. And you always come back to that one of, I feel like we should have beaten them. So that's three less for them, three more for us. We could have beaten Ipswich, could have beaten Man United. And there is this feeling of like, well, Villa haven't really got going just yet. And it's it's been a good start, but you know we've not really played amazingly. So there's that weird kind of doubt. But the points show... <laughs> We've picked them up. We've been very good. We've been unbeaten since, what, August, September, whenever that Arsenal game was. That's the only defeat in any competition. Like, Villa are doing really well, but it doesn't really feel like it. It's it's such a strange feeling, isn't it? I think draws have become the new defeats, haven't they? When yeah, we don't, yeah. We're so conditioned to winning now that when we don't win a game, we're like, oh. Um, I mean, I'd argue with your pecking order there. I'm not saying that Villa should be number one, but I think Arsenal in recent years have proved themselves to be closest to, to Man City. So the fact that we're matching, okay, listen, they've dropped some points that they, they wouldn't have expected to drop or wouldn't want to drop. But the fact that we're managing, we're, we're matching the points tally um, yeah. 
you know, the kind of results tally, if you like, of the only club that's pushed Man City close in the last couple of years. You know, I mean, we run out of nice things to say, don't we? But that we're just behaving like we belong at the moment. Yeah. And I just hope that we can sustain it. First of all, from John, we've kind of just spoke about this in the intro, I suppose. He says, are we so good that we have started taking a 3-1 win away at Fulham who would have gone above us if they'd beaten us for granted? It does kind of have that feeling, doesn't it? Of like, well, this is just what we do. But that was a potential banana skin game that would have just gone, yeah, all right, fine, we win. I don't mind that complacency creeping in if it's when it's a win that you expect to yeah. win and we win. To me, it's the the meltdown when we don't win that I think is the thing that we're going to have to struggle with, that we're going to have to rise above in a way. That's not to say that if you, if you build a run of form that becomes expected and becomes natural, of course, you're going to be disappointed when you fall away from that. But I do think at the back of our minds, I've got this real fear, Dan, and this is probably from, I don't know, going to the Etihad a couple of times in the last year. I'm not trying to dig out Man City fans again. But it's such a fine line be- between being a winner and being a winning club and being entitled. And I think every step of the way, we've got to always remember that this, this is still an evolving process. We're not the real deal yet. You know, maybe if we've won three league titles on the spin, I can forgive us when we drop points that we, you know, I can I can forgive the meltdown when we drop points that we that we shouldn't. But I agree with John that he does feel like, ah, oh, well, you know, like yeah. last time we were in the Premier League or the first time we got back in the Premier League with, with Dean Smith and a way win like that, we'd have been <laughs> dancing on the streets, wouldn't we? Whereas now, yeah, this is what we do. Uh, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it shows that we belong. I just think like the reverse that just forgive some of the setbacks because they will come. What was he? Did he question something? Was the question something about smug? Yeah, John John said something like, I kind of looked at the result and was just like, oh, yeah, there we go. I quite, feel quite smug about it. Like I expected us yeah. to win anyway, so there it was. So I've coined the, coined the phrase, smug shrug complacency, which, again, I don't, I don't well, don't particularly... Um, I don't think that'll catch on. You'll never <laughs> sing that. <laughs> anyway, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on. Uh, next question is from Yawny McYawn Face, which is probably quite appropriate for the 8 a.m. recording time. Um, should Villa be allowed to kick off five minutes earlier the opposition each match so that we can get rid of those inevitable early cobwebs? Or can we have a quick five aside instead of doing the pre match lineup? <laughs> we never used to be slow starters, did we? We used to score quite no, early on we were, we, were, we? we were fast um, stars, yeah. There was that graphic of you know, Villa scoring more goals than any other in the first 15 minutes or so and going on to win games from that position. Whereas now, we, I don't know, maybe we're, we're so good we have to give the opposition a one-goal head start just to kick us into gear. Yeah, it begs the question of what they do on the coach. They should have um, <laughs> they have things like travel battleships and stuff like that and Uno. Yeah, we had um, a travel um, guess who when we went on holiday and we used it probably once and then threw it away. We're, we're big fans of big big fans of Uno, we are. We're an exciting household, as you can see. But what they need is a travel prize where it lies. So you oh, just right, have a yeah. little kind of one and it just gets your kind of fingers flicking. So you're not it's not exhausting you. You're just keeping your brain sharp yeah. and you keep it, you're keeping your target practice and your eye in. Um, so I think you need that for away games. I thought I you were going to say um, on the Uno theme that Emmy Martinez can have an Uno reverse in his in his socks or something. So when he concedes, he goes, "Oh, actually, that's your conceding goal." <laughs> oh, he would, wouldn't he? He'd have a swap hands, wouldn't he? You think you <laughs> you'd think you you'd be five 0 down? Emmy Martinez would have a swap hands at the last uh, the last couple of minutes. <laughs> Listen, I reckon I do more a more intensive workout than than Villa on home games. So I park twenty minutes away to miss the traffic, <laughs> and then I walk up or climb up about 30 flights of stairs in the Trinity. So, oh, yeah. It's quite a walk, isn't it, up them yeah. stairs? It's um, old school, isn't it, when players used to have to go and run up and down the terraces and stuff like yeah. that. Get them climbing the Trinity before the match, mate. That will either wake them up or absolutely leave them in nothing <laughs> left. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's strange, though. I'm not sure, sure how that has, that has crept in. Maybe it is some of the things that we've said, the excuses that we've reeled off the, straight after a European game, after international break and stuff but um, even when Villa concede a goal now and I don't want to jinx this forever more but when we concede a goal you don't think you're going to lose the game 1-0 you think there's going to be yeah. a few more twists and turns beyond that yeah and that exactly was the point I was going to make and it kind of comes back to, to John's initial one of kind of taking things for granted especially like four minutes in against Fulham you know you've got, the, you've got 90 to play at, at that point you know at least uh, I'm not worried at all but even if we went 1-0 down at 
half time or 60 minutes, I'm still thinking Villa are going to score here and not feel too downbeat. It was maybe different circumstances if, if we'd gone down early against Bayern Munich, maybe you think, well, oh, they're a good side, you know, they could run away with it kind of thing. In a Premier League game, if we weren't go 1 0 down pretty much anywhere at any point to any team, I'd still think. Oh, we've still got a chance of coming back here. Yeah, I think that's a kind of game management thing from from the boss as well, isn't it? You know, it's, football matches are quite long, longer than they ever used to be. Um, so just we've set off with a plan. Obviously, Emery is bright enough and tactically flexible enough to change during, during games. But I don't think an early goal necessarily sparks no. a change either because Villa are set up to try and go and score that. It's not as if Villa often camp in and say, well... We're going to do nothing and accept a draw or spring you on the break. Villa are set up from the off normally to try and get a goal anyway. So yeah. even that early goal doesn't really change the way that, that he wants us to play early on in game. The only thing it would change is the opposition. If that if they're thinking we're lucky here that 1-0 is all we, the best we can do, they're going to sit further back and it's going to be harder for Villa to break them down. But you know, ultimately, as we saw against Fulham, often that doesn't matter. Next question from Phil says, tongue firmly in cheek, how many points do we need to stay up this year? <laughs> Somebody replied saying another 23, which gets us to 40. But it's not been 40 points for donkey's years, has it? What was the tally that we went down with in 2016? Seven, 17. 17, so what we've got. So we don't get another point all season. It would uh, have the same, yeah. Another 80, I think, should do it. So if we just <laughs> aim for that, <laughs> let's see where it takes us. But isn't it? And obviously, you know, Phil is not suggesting we're in a relegation battle and it's not this kind of typical brummy negativity. But again, it just kind of speaks to how, how far we've come over a short, short space of time that a lot of people's kind of like inner targets for Villa is get to that 40 point mark and then we'll work it out from there. Uh, and again, just the way the mindset has changed that that's not how you think about football anymore. You, you're you not looking at oh, Wolves almost beat Man City. You know, that, that would have been a bad result for us because you know, we're, we're fighting with Wolves. I was thinking the other way around, like, would it have been nice for Man City to drop points because you know, that might affect Villa at the top end. So, yeah, just the way that we assess football, I think, from this first kind of 10 or 15 minutes or so of this podcast is how I have now changed over over the years. You just you just assess it totally differently because the expectation is different. Yeah, I'm getting there gradually. I do think when we've hit 40 points, <laughs> should we bank some of them for next year just in case? We can just <laughs> calm down. <laughs> but, uh, no, you're exactly right. With that, that Wolves game, I was... Um, out for lunch with my mum and dad because it was their anniversary. And uh, your dad's a Wolves fan, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. And it was just in the corner of the screen. And I said to him, like he kept he kept glancing over at the screen while we were eating our food. And I said, Dad, this marriage is not going to last if you if you're on a date with your wife. And it's uh, they're 51 years in, so I think they'll be all right. But uh, <laughs> it was that. It was like, oh, Wolves are winning here. This is a good good result for the whole yeah. Kendrick family. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, it was. Um, it, it's nice to not worry about what's going on at the the, the bottom third yeah, of the table. Yeah. Um, it, all, I think this all this is a, how do we come to terms with being being a big club as a fan base and how do we how do we do it in the right way? Yeah, that might be the title of this episode. By the way, I don't do the title till the end. So I don't know what we've spoken about, but like coming to terms with like this is the expectation of Aston Villa now is kind of the mood that I think that we're we're probably all going through on a similar kind of theme from Paul, who's talking about points. And he says, a couple of ifs coming up, so bear with him. If Unai had been here since the start of the 22-23 season, and if injuries hadn't ruined us last season and saw us limp over the line, is it fair to assume that we'd have been around the 80-point mark in both seasons? So based off like points per game of Emery's tenure so far, effectively. We are currently on course for 81 points and have been in nothing like top form. I mean, 81 points. How is he working this out? Because we're pretty much two points a game. We're just over two points a game, aren't we? So 38 times two is 76. So yeah, okay, not, not a million miles off. The title has been won four times in the last 10 years with 80-something points. Leicester won it with 81. If, there's that word again, we suffer a lot less with injuries this season, I see no reason why we won't get 80-plus points this year. Where that gets us remains to be seen. So Paul has gone kind of the total opposite way than the us of kind of like tempering expectation a little bit. He's just kind of going, well, if we don't get 80 points, I'm going to be off. But based off the Emery era so far of, of pretty much two years now, that is kind of where Villa have, have leveled out to, this two points per game thing. So if that is 76 to 80 odd points, I'm not suggesting that's enough to win a title, but it would certainly be enough to finish in the top four which is probably Villa's target. Yeah, what's the phrase? If my auntie had what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of ifs there, Paul. Come on. I'm trying to pick my way through this question. Is this question 
suggesting that we should be title challengers. Potentially. I think it shows a level of consistency that we're kind of going, you know, Villa, can Villa keep this up? Well, we have so far, so what reason is this to suggest that won't continue? Yeah, I think the, the sticking point with the ifs is that's life. And, yeah. you know, nobody really gets a smooth run to anything. There has to be challenges to, to overcome. You know, I, I know he's referenced the injuries last year, but we were running on empty, weren't we, towards the end? Um, I wonder what another ten games that season would have done to us. You know, I'm not not mm. sure where we where we'd have ended up. So, I do think that we've shown staggering consistency. I think that's probably been one of the the biggest shocks and surprises that we're all. And again, it probably it feeds back to a worn down by history mentality and a cynicism and a skepticism and all this kind of thing. But we're all thinking. When's this? When's this drop going to come? When's this? When's this crisis going to come? And the fact that it hasn't suggests that Emery's got found a way that whatever squad he's got, whatever team he's got, found a way to win football matches and keep us ticking. You know, I'd, I'd rather speculate about speculate about the eighty-one points when we've got the other side of Christmas. We've seen what we are as a squad, and we we haven't had any horrible injuries to contend with. Touch wood for this season specifically. I don't want to give too much credence to what came before, even though that does set us up for this level of consistency going forward. But if you focus on just this season at the moment, it's only eight games. If we're still around the two points per game mark after twenty, and we're on forty odd points, then yeah, you'd kind of say double that over the second half of the season, and we're in a, an amazing place. But it comes with the the rough and the smooth of what the Premier League is. We will lose games that you don't expect us to, we may get an injury to somebody that will really, really damage us. You kind of said something there about like, you know, we're kind of waiting for the, the crisis to come and it hasn't. You could argue that the crisis came last year with the injuries that we had and you're right, if the season, you know, if that was kind of game week 28 and there was still 10 more to go at that point, would we have fallen out of the top four? Probably, yeah, because we were, we were really kind of limping over the line. However, we've had a lot of consistency over the last two years which kind of just makes me feel like, well, it will continue but you just know that there may be something that we can't just sit here and go, well, Villa will be in the top four again, that's settled, because there's still 30 games to go and anything can happen to to a, a certain extent. Different issue as well, Dan, is the elite level of competition we're in in Europe. Yeah. That, okay, we've had European football last year and we went you know, deep into the season with European football, but we haven't had tests like this uh, as often as we're going to get. Um, and obviously this year we're going to go all the way in the FA Cup as well and win it. So, you know, that's going to take take its toll as well, isn't it? So, uh, I don't know. I think, it, I think it's really, I think it's really interesting. I think I'm, I'm glad that, that he's pointed out how consistent we've been. Cause I think look back and work through some of the components that have got us there. It is this being competitive in every game. I still can't think of people probably point to Newcastle away at the start of last season. And mm. I mean, Outside of that, did we get we got a, a little bit of a beating at Anfield, I think, didn't we? Didn't we last season as well? But I can't think of many games where we've not looked like we're going to take at least a point. Uh, yeah, and that's the very definition of being consistent, isn't it? Really? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Gareth Dick, something a little bit different. He says every successful Villa side or any side actually over the years has had a strong spine: striker, midfield, defender, goalkeeper. Ollie Watkins, Yuri Tielemans, and Emmy Martinez tick the boxes for the, those positions. However, who would you say is the most important centre back? Pau Torres or Ezri Konsa? Oh, it's like asking which is your favourite child, isn't it? I've only got one, so that's an easy answer. Yeah, that'd be a lot easier for me. No, well, it's normally <laughs> when people ask me, I can normally name my least favourite child, depending <laughs> on what the occasion is, not the favourite. That'd be unfair. I, was, I saw this question yesterday and I was going to do some Googling about the, the various parts of the spine. I did actually find that there's five parts. The spine can be split into five main parts, which gives you your goalkeeper, your two centre-backs, your midfielder, your striker and two centre-backs. So I could have swerved <laughs> this question that way. Like a five-a-side team then? That's it, yeah. <laughs> My spine is like a five-a-side team. <laughs> I love the, um, the query of like a spine in football is like a classic thing in one of each position and you've taken it one further to go well actually there's five there should be it might just be my spine it might just be a, <laughs> I don't know you can interpret it a couple of ways the fact that the fact that Uno Emery thinks that Esri Konza can play at fullback and we're still strong down the middle 
but we haven't had the need when we spoke about it, didn't we? In the the last Q and A about potentially Pau Torres if he ever had to play left back. Oh God, I'm 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 stalling there. I'm stalling. I think defensively, I worry more when Ezri Cons is not not in the team, shall we say? But that's probably a very cheap and easy criticism that our oh, Pau Torres he's got a sweet left foot. He's a footballing centre half, but. Can he defend 100% consistently and, and can he deal with the physical demands? I don't know. I'll throw it back to you. What 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 do you think, Daniel? Uh, I was hoping you wouldn't come back to me and I was just here to ask the questions. Uh, it's it's very difficult and they're both important in their own way um, <laughs> to be diplomatic about it. I think you can probably split it down the middle that defensively, Konsu is more important, but going forward and the way we play, as much as it sounds crazy, that going forward is important for a centre-back. We don't play the way we do as well if Pau Torres wasn't there. There was that drop-off last year around Christmas when Torres was injured for, what was it, eight weeks or something, six weeks? And we and we struggled during that time and didn't win games that we probably should have done and may have done if he was there. So I think to, to Emery and the way that we want to play, I think Torres is probably more important. But in terms of, like again, it comes back to like the definition of a spine. <laughs> I think Conso is a better fit for like a spine of a side. Don't know why. Yeah, what is he when he plays right back then? Is he like a kidney or something? <laughs> yeah, well, like a, I don't know, like a collarbone or something. A bit further over. Um, should we move on? <laughs> I think so, yeah. I don't think, you know, uh, we need we need one of those kind of like doctor skeletons next time so we can point. Yeah. Yeah, that would fit perfectly right. in that little gap next to you there. That would be totally random, but it would be a, a talking I'll stick point. Stick a billet hat on him or something, couldn't I? Next question from John is probably something we can't get into now, depending on time, but I'll see if you can think of anything. I've not got anything word for word in front of me here, apart from the, oh yeah, remember when he used to play for Villa? Trend on social media at the moment. And I've seen Matt Lynch do this and a couple of others for other clubs as well. Like, oh, do you remember when he played for Everton? And it's like an 11 of players where you go, oh yeah, remember him? And he, he, he messaged me and said, have you done this for Villa? Have you done this on the podcast before? And I said, no. And then I queried whether that was a whole episode in itself, going like back and forth over each position, yeah. or whether it was like just a talking point in an episode like this. And I feel like I've got nothing like, off the top of my head for now. I've got two. I've Go got on, then. Two. I wouldn't be able to pick an 11 for you at this time in the morning. Oivin Leonardson. I don't know who that is. <laughs> so, so that works. <laughs> so there you go. Gabor Kirilli. Mm-hmm. Track suits. Yeah, yeah. Robert anyway. Pires? Yeah, Pires. I mean, I was a Villa reporter when, when, when we signed Pires, so that, that's quite a, a strong memory for me. I feel like if, if neutral fans saw that, they go, when did he play for Villa? Yeah. I feel like I saw this suggestion on Twitter, so this isn't mine. Somebody said something like, outside of Villa fans, would anyone know that Kyle Walker played for Villa at one stage? Yeah, that's, that's a good example as well. Is it the forgettable ones in terms of... They weren't very good, or is it just the ones that have made their fame and fortune elsewhere? Yeah, I, I think I think it's it's probably a bit of both. I think it probably leans more towards the one of like if you kind of suddenly go, "Here's a picture of a player," you go, "Oh yeah, like he looks weird in that 2011 football shirt." Maybe we reach out to the comments and we come back to this at a later date. If if there's a full podcast in there, just basically reminiscing about old footballers, which is you know, quite a fun thing to do, um, we can do that. And maybe some help from the comments as well. And a bit more time to think about it. I think we could probably put an 11 together. There's one more, I reckon, Peter Schmeichel as well. If you're looking about yeah, the wider possibly. perception. Yeah, possibly. You know, you've got Man United, don't you? Rob Henry says, I can't quite get my head around this question, so I'm hoping you can better. If our squad of players were like one of those wooden block puzzles that you get where you mix and match different parts, so you know, when you like flip it over, it's like a policeman's head and then a, a yeah. nurse's body or whatever. That's what I was thinking of. What footballing attributes slash physical features slash character would you mix and match between our players to make the perfect player? Does that make sense? It does, but I think it's attributes rather than attributes. Ah, oh, have I, I done it again? I think I've pulled you on this before, haven't I? Yeah, I still can't remember which one it is. Attributes. That's what I said, isn't it? No, you said attributes the first time. Oh, did I? <sighs> yeah. So I think if it was a Clown Rude podcast, I think it'd be my vocabulary, <laughs> your edited skills. My good looks. Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. And Townley's, <laughs> Townley's football obsessiveness. I'm going to leave this in the edit, although he didn't want me to. The Villa Social is out on Thursday. We're doing like a two year special of Avu and I Emery. And I pulled up Ty Bracey on something he said. Like he said a word wrong. Oh, what was it? He said epitome. And I went, hang on a minute, do you mean epitome? 
And he's like, what? Have I been saying it wrong like, all these years? And then he like swore loads and loads to, like, to say, well, you can't use any of that now. I said, well, I can. I'll just use the bit before you start swearing. So I haven't edited it yet. And if it's not in there, now nah, well, that's out there. So yeah, the epitome of whatever. Just made me laugh. He's going um, to kill you now. You've lost a guest. That's yeah. opened up the opportunity for me to finally um, <laughs> get to the social. I, can, I associate that more with, you know, when you used to... Um, this was pre-internet days, Dan. <laughs> you used to have a piece of paper and you'd have somebody would draw the head on it, then you'd yeah, fold, it, fold it, it. You'd draw the yeah. body. Maybe they yeah. could do that on the villa coach. Exactly, yeah. 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 Not Emmy Martinez though, because he might get kind of a RSI in his fingers. Um get what in his fingers? Repetitive strain injury. Oh right. Okay. <laughs> I'm not I'm not up to date on these medical jargon. So how many how many components? Three. Didn't say. <laughs> so we could do what we, maybe this is a whole podcast in itself as well. Oh Christ! So we're kind uh, of looking for the best attributes. Attributes. Attributes of let's say four, like a spine. Four <laughs> Villa players. <laughs> four Villa players is best attributes. Attributes to make the best. <laughs> the best player. I will start. Go Emmy on. Martinez's winning mentality. We. And I suppose it depends on what what are we creating here. Uh, is it a striker? Because if it is, like, I don't need Pau Torres' ball-playing ability. Do you know what I mean? I think it just needs to be a footballer. Okay. Um, I would have John McGinn's relentless kind of work rate. Yeah. I suppose I'd put that in there. Your move. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will take Luca Dean's bounce-back ability. The ability to be written off or, you know, seemingly on his way out of the door and then come back and be... But one of our best players. Your move. Wat- <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was going to say, I was going to say I'd have Ollie Watkins' his aftershave, but uh, <laughs> from a previous one. But I probably would have, I mean, I don't know how you phrase this, but Ollie Watkins' his quest for self improvement. Yeah. Okay. So always striving to be a better version of yeah. yourself. Yeah, there's probably is a better way to phrase that, like the, the quest for perfection or something, like wanting to be yeah. the, like the best player ever. Yeah. So that's Emmy Martinez's winning ability, Luca Dean's bounce back ability, John McGinn's um, kind of quest. What was the John McGinn's one? Got relentlessness, I suppose. Yeah, like a boundless energy, kind of yeah. never never say die attitude. And Ollie Watkins's quest for, for perfection make a pretty decent player, wouldn't it? That would probably make a good midfielder, I would say. Yeah, it'd be good yeah. if we'd have drawn that. In bar yeah. point crayon. <laughs> right. Peter asked the following question, but Angela, Nigel, and David also asked similar about Leon Bailey. At the risk of winding people up, how long can we live with having Bailey at right wing? How much extra benefit of the doubt is he given because of the brilliance he showed last season? And if he doesn't start, who does? Yeah, so like I said, I know you, you listed a few names there. It sounded like it's going to be a riddle there. Peter and Angela have got... <laughs> like a maths question. That's Peter it, yeah. has six oranges. <laughs> Leon Bailey, dot, 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 discuss. There's a couple of things at play here, isn't there? There's, he seems to have returned to his physically, I wouldn't say fragile, that's harsh, you know, I wish I was as physically fragile as Leon Bailey. But he seems to be more susceptible to injuries this season and knocks them a bit like he was in his first season with us. Um, so I think that's that's a big factor. A couple of times, uh, certainly at Villa Park in recent weeks, he just hasn't he hasn't been fully match fit or the amount of match fit that you need to be to be a winger, um, yeah. an explosive winger in the in the Premier League. I still think that the Moussa Diaby effect. I think it was so important to him. I think he thought actually I can feel this guy's. You know, quite literally, the breath breath down down my neck. I mean, somebody who signed for for big money and somebody who um, Emery Emery had signed, rather than mm. a previous manager Inherited. signing. As much as we probably felt we should have got more from DRB, and perhaps which is ridiculous, really, when you look at the, the amount of games mm. that he was involved with, and his numbers weren't bad bad either. As much as we we thought that. The impact of that signing of signing Diaby was to reawaken Leon Bailey. Now, the challenge that we've got now is that Diaby's not there. I'm not saying that, that Bailey's become deliberately complacent because I don't think that is the case. But I think, you know, the question was asked, who's the replacement? I suppose Philogene is the obvious replacement. I know that there can be differences in terms of what wing 
wingers favour nowadays. But I don't think that he feels quite that kind of pressure from Philogene yeah. that he would have done from from Diaby. So I don't know. I lost my train of thought a couple of times there. But does that make sense? It does make sense. I would say there's probably some injury doubts this season as well throughout throughout the season. Obviously, Emery's playing him, so he's a level of fitness to play games. Obviously, but there's just. Yeah, there has to be something there more so than just what well, Diaby's gone. So I'm I'm not as good anymore. I don't think that's that's the case. Well, it's not as simple as that anyway. I think there's got to be some kind of injury issue. I mean, Philogene, unless his red card is overturned, which I don't think it can be anyway, won't play at the weekend anyway. So unless John McGinn comes in and, and takes Bailey's spot, there's again not much pressure there. Philogene will probably play in the Champions League, I would suspect, because he can't play at the weekend. Um, but that doesn't solve the, the Leon Bailey issue. If he doesn't play. Maybe there's a way to get John Duran into the side instead, and and that's the, the the way that you're not replacing Bailey as a winger. You stick Duran in the middle, and and McGinn does play in Bailey's spot or something like that. But it would be nice. And and again, this, and we'll kind of touch on this in a little bit towards the very end. It comes back to what we said at the start. We're we're doing well despite these things. That like Bailey's not in red hot form, and we've still won we still lost one game. But it's not that we were relying on him this time last year, but he was contributing much more than he was and he was an asset for us, whereas at the moment we're kind of carrying him but still getting through. So it's a bit like the kind of concern about conceding too many goals. Well, whilst we're winning games, some of these things don't matter too much at the moment. Yeah, and I think the big thing about our wide players as well, it kind of depends who's playing at fullback. You probably could bring, although McGinn's not a, a natural, you know, he can play anywhere across the park, I'm sure, but he's not a natural winger. If you've got cash at fullback, at least it gives you that that runner mm-hmm. beyond him. So I think I think that can be a factor as well. We've said it before, Dan, haven't we? It's the, it's the kind of winger's prerogative, isn't it? It's a bit like a, a bit like a thermos flask, isn't it? It can be hot or cold, depending on what's inside. And what's inside at the moment is Leon Bailey, who doesn't seem to quite either back himself or yeah. or whatever to, to to be the player of old. Um, but again, we're blessed at the moment with with options. And it might not be natural kind of out and out who you'd associate with being wingers. Those might, those might not be the options. But you've got a master tactician who, if he's got lots and lots of fit and available, very talented footballers, that's his puzzle to solve in terms of how yeah. he lines them up. So um, over the course of a season, a club that has gone from desperately trying to stay in the division to really compete at the, at the top end of the division, you're not going to have everybody who's on it putting kind of Champions League top four level performances every week. If you've yeah. got a manager who can work with what's around it to make sure that we're still picking up the points along the way, then it might have to be the be one that either we have a makeshift solution in that position or Emery does. And I think this came back to the question as well. Has he got enough credit in the bank from last year to continue to earn Emery's trust and patience? And, and at the moment... And we might think that's the best option because if he does get Leon Bailey to play himself into form at a time when the rest of the team is set up to still win us football matches, then that's kind of win-win in a way. I like the idea of Leon Bailey being a, an Aston Villa themed thermo flask, but then I'm also worried that Chris Heck might try and flog him in the club shop for forty quid a pop, and I'll be forced to buy one. They'd only be they'd be rumming it there, wouldn't they? Rather, than... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. That was a Caribbean thing. That wasn't a Leon Bailey. Thing. <laughs> James says we often hear rivals mention the Hawkeye slash Neeland incident as what kept us up. What sliding doors moment would you change if able to? For me, Fergie time, allowing Bruce to score those two goals versus Wednesday, I believe if United lost that day, we'd have had the momentum to be champions. I've kind of included this as a little bit of a shameless plug that we did Aston Villa sliding doors last year, I think, which is like a timeless episode that things we said then won't be out of date now, I don't think anyway, unless it was like a Douglas Louise section, which I don't think there was. Uh, it was all like looking back, we had like, what if Delph never left? What if Ben Teke never went to Liverpool? That kind of thing. So that link for that episode will be in the description down below if you want to go back and listen to that. You weren't on that. So is anything spring to mind that, that you would change? The big one is obviously the, the Glenn Whelan one, but... Yeah, when Glenn Whelan's missed penalty and everything spoiled from there, Dean Smith came in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. One that I've got, I think sliding doors when the going is good are the real ones where you think, "Ah, oh, blimey!" And I think um, you reference this reference this season um, earlier on when you're talking about Villa start to this current season. Dwight York leaving mm. for Man United in. The summer of 98, I think, 
And we burst out the blocks that year. And I think by Christmas time, I think we might even have been top of the table um, yeah. under John Gregory in 98-99. That was without Dwight York. So yeah. if we'd have had Dwight York in that team, would we have had the staying power? Would we got over the line? I think we fell away and finished fifth or sixth or even seventh that year. So it wasn't one where, you know, the one that the, the guy who's asked the question is, is, is referring to, we were head to head with, with United to, to win the, win the title that year. But in both those situations, it was the springboard for Manchester United to get further away from us. You know, they mm. took our best player, won the treble. Um, listen, we had Julian Jochim and, and Dion Dublin and even a bit of Stan Collymore. So as a, as a Premier League strike force, that's pretty good, even without Dwight York. But that having, having lost our way to the Steve Bruce, Fergie time, Man United in the early 90s, for that to happen again when I thought we were going to get closer to their coattails uh, in the late 90s. It was a, we're going to have to wait again, aren't we? We're going to have to wait until Unai Emery rocks up in the in the two thousand twenty. I mean, another Man United one very quickly that I would pick out, and I think I probably did on the other episode, was the 2010 League Cup final. What if we'd have won that? Would O'Neill have stayed? Would we have got into the Champions League sooner than we did? Let's move on to our final question before comment of the week from Mark, who says, let's talk about technology in football. We've got VAR, Hawkeye. I love this one as technology. Referees, foam spray. <laughs> what else, if anything, would you introduce? I'd like the refs to have a laser measure to make sure the wall is at the correct distance back from a free kick. I love the idea of that. So it's that one way when they come and measure up your house and they can beep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although, and I'll get back onto the point in a minute, you know what impresses me? When tradesmen have, they can handle like a, a, a proper old school tape measure, like a, a kind of yo-yo expert or a lasso expert, and they can just like flick it or just yeah. kind of, I'm scared that when I press the button on one of those old school <laughs> tape measures, it's going gonna, it's gonna to tear my delicate you know, little fingers. Yeah. I love the skill of that. I think this should be like some kind of um, tape measure champion championships. Um, maybe you could have like a physical, rather than like a laser for this wall thing, maybe you have like a physical tape and you attach it to like, you know, Bruno Fernandes' collar in the wall. Referee pulls it back and he says, if you move, this thing's going to ping back at you. Maybe that's like the threat of not having to creep the wall forward. Well, I thought, do you know, um, back on the kind of encroachment thing, you know our trolleys around the perimeter of the car park have that magnetic strip? So yeah. You can't take your trolley, well, you probably can yeah. if you lift it over, but you can't take your trolley off. So I'm giving tips to trolley thieves here. You can't take the trolley because it stops. So you do that so the players physically, almost like can't a get over field. like a force field, yeah. Yeah. So that, um, and the other thing I thought, and this might have been prompted again by, by lunch with my, my mum and dad, they live in this kind of warden-controlled flat now. So you know that, I mean, mum rocked up, but she's got a new piece of jewellery, but it was like this little plastic cord still hanging around. So she, she was supposed to wear it in the flat, but she was wearing <laughs> it like this necklace. I thought footballers should have that. So rather than rolling around when they're feigning injury, if they're yeah. properly injured, they should have this thing around their neck and they should press the button and it sets off like a massive alarm that goes all the way around the stadium. And if you were genuinely hurt, you know, your paramedics and stuff and your, and your stretchers and your physios can spring into life. If you're not genuinely hurt, it just takes away, you know, <laughs> if you're that much of a play actor that you're prepared to have all these alarms going yeah. on. Do you know what I mean? So that 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 was my, good. my thinking. I, mean, I don't know whether you, it probably wouldn't be safe to wear it around your neck. Um, no, think of the shirt pulling the dangerous. Anyway, um, no designated silly question this week, but we've done our fair share of silliness yes. start this episode. So we're going to end with comment of the week from Millie. This was on the post-match show for Fulham. Obviously, we didn't do a Q&A last week and things that we did aren't up to date as this. What I'm kind of enjoying at the moment, and one thing that's really starting to fill me full of confidence, is I'm hearing things like a lot of Arsenal, Tottenham, Newcastle, and even City fans at times saying things like, well, it's because so-and-so isn't available, or so-and-so is not fit. So no wonder we're having a bit of a drop-off. We've swapped out Bailey, Rogers, Watkins, and Anana, and there's no drop-off during games. In fact, we seem to be stronger and can add to that. We have one of the best defensive midfielders in the league to return, hopefully a strong centre-back to return. And I don't even think we've hit any kind of form yet and we can still pick up results like we did against Fulham. Which kind of brings us full circle to how we started the episode that 
we have this sense of like, we're not the finished article here. There's something bubbling, bubbling away underneath. And we haven't got time to get into this now. And it's kind of like football cliches, podcast territory about like the idea of gears in football that really confuses me when people say like, you're not out of first gear or second, or we could have gone up to fourth gear, which is good. Yeah, that's what I say. Everything we haven't got out of first gear. So first gear is like yeah. when the car's going slow and your engine's r- roaring. So yeah, you, your fastest gear is depends how many gears you've got in your gear. But I'll drive an automatic now. So um sixth gear, I suppose. <laughs> I mean, I'm not an F1 fan. I don't know how they think those things work, but uh No, that's true. So I feel like we're in sixth gear, that's what's purring away. That's our, that's what's in our swash our swashbuckling form. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think at the moment I think Villa have got the kind of vibe of like a startup company where mm. it's new, but they're learning quickly and yeah. they're almost dealing with any setbacks on the hoof. And they probably haven't got some of the pre existing advantages of big business, but that's it. Doesn't but the matter. The guy who's like the CEO, he's full of experience and he's kind of like training everyone, training everyone up on the job to be like, like, I know what is required here. If you all get to my level, this is Emery, obviously, we will achieve things. Yeah, and I think it's that drive and that excitement of the new and the adventure of it that's, yeah. oh, don't worry about that. Look, you know, we, <laughs> we, can, we can cope with that. We can cope with that. And I think it's that it's that mentality which gives it this this energy to to see setbacks as challenges rather than threats, I think. Uh, yeah. I don't know what that's got, don't know what that's got to do with gears particularly, brother. <laughs> well, me neither. But I think that's uh, the right way to end this podcast. So we're, I'd say we're in fourth or fifth gear at the moment. We've, we've just come to a, a, good, a good ending there. Now we're going to stick it in reverse and go home. Matt, thanks for joining me. As always on the podcast, it's been a pleasure to chat Aston Villa with you. Thanks for everyone watching along or listening to this episode of the Claret Blue podcast. So we're going to be a busy week. We'll be back tomorrow with a post-match show for Bologna. That'll be you and I again, won't it? It's a home game, so we'll be we'll be here tomorrow night, late after Villa Park. Hopefully, another win in the Champions League, which really set Villa on their way to to qualifying for the for the next stage with nine points out of nine. So come back for that tomorrow evening. The Villa Social is out on Thursday, and then we'll build up to Bournemouth at the back end of the week as well. Matt, thanks for joining me. Thank you for watching or listening, and we'll see you tomorrow. 